Uh, I want to talk a bit about nationalist superheroes, but to do which are superheroes that identify with particular countries. The most famous is obviously Captain America. Uh, and in my book, I talk a bit more about British nationalist superheroes and Canadian nationalist superheroes. Today, we're going to keep it pretty close to Captain America because we don't have a lot of time. But, uh, but the first question is what does this matter? Right? Why should we be caring about superheroes at all? And I want to start by talking about this concept of identity. Okay, identity is something that is fundamental to not only who we are, but how we view the world and our place in it. So I'll start with this cover from an old Superboy uh, comic book. And the guy on the left, his name is Bizarro Superman. He says, why does everybody hate me, Superboy? I have superpowers like you. I do good like you. Yet, you're a hero to me, excuse me, you're a hero to them, and I'm a menace. Right? Well, Bizarro Superman is something a bit like Frankenstein, which seems to be the point. Um, Nevertheless, has a sort of longer history, right? He comes from the bizarro world. Far out in space exists an amazing marvel of the cosmos, a square world. It is the home planet of the bizarro creatures. Astonishingly, everything on this cube-shaped world is a wacky version of earthly civilization. City skyscrapers lean crookedly at all angles, for the pathetic bizarro people hate perfection. Right? I love the, the, the way that they talk about this stuff. It's kind of massively over the top. So you have Superman, who's good, does good things. You have bizarro Superman, who is the opposite, right? And yet, and, and that's clearly what's being called out here, right? It comes from the square world. What kind of world is that? Absolutely nuts. And their buildings are all crooked and look strange. And staircases, apparently, and they all do this against perfection. Um, but the point is, though, that the narrator is clearly trying to contrast the bizarre world with Earth. Right? It is the unearth. It is the opposite. And yet, if you narrate it slightly differently, you get a different picture. Right? So you have, yes, it's a cube-shaped planet, but it looks just like Earth, basically, right? Water, continents, looks like it has some sort of atmosphere like ours. And yeah, there are skyscrapers perhaps are slightly uh, interesting archa archa architecturally, let's say archaeologically, architecturally. Um, but you know, they build skyscrapers and they have cities. And they seem to live in a way that's somewhat like ours, even if with more moons. Okay? So really, the differences between people, that the identity that they have, is a, is a product of how you narrate that, right? Everybody is marked by similarities and differences. And if you talk about them in a way that brings forth the similarities, you'll think of them as being like you. And if you describe it slightly differently, you end up with the opposite, right? You end up with your bizarro, bizarro uh, students, for instance. Right now in the bizarro world, I like to think of this class meeting, you know, and everybody's sitting on the ceiling or something, but, you know, equally listening to somebody blathering on. What does this have to do with geopolitics? Right? It's just, just made up comic books in my mind. Well, if we look at the Cold War, for instance, we can see the way in which identity is a key lens through which that, that conflict takes on meaning. Okay, so we have a divide between West and East, which is commonly how this is narrated. You have, so for instance, on the map, you have the blue areas, which were West and the areas in various reds and oranges as the areas that were designated east. And these are the characteristics that, at least in the west, were imputed to the different places. So the west is good, while the east is evil. The west is democratic, while the east is authoritarian. The west is capitalist, while the east is centrally planned, to the economy. The west is religious, while the east is secular. And the west is individualist, while the east Communist, right? So notice there's a set of, if you will, bizarro characteristics. The East is some sort of alien version of the West. Now, this is not just through the Cold War. In fact, we can see how in various geopolitical orders, different narrations are occurring. And it's interesting because it goes to show how flexible these identities are. Right? So for instance, in George Bush's uh, language of the war on terror, Right? The West became not religious, but secular, or pluralist, or some word like that, while it was the East that was religious. Okay? So, you know, in truth, it's really about sort of how you want to talk about things rather than any actual innate characteristics of either of the people. Okay? So the stories we tell about the world and the way geopolitics unfolds actually say less about the world than it does about us. Okay? And yet, they matter in the world. 
So let's talk a little bit about superheroes again. There's this notion called American exceptionalism. I should let me start off by saying superheroes actually originated as a genre of storytelling in the US in the 1930s, right? And that's actually kind of relevant to the way the stories are told. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, but that's why I'm talking about the US in this context. Uh, American exceptionalism is this idea that the United States is a world, is a country unlike any other in the world. And there's a, a number of reasons that are given, right? For instance, the way in which it's created as a sort of revolutionary uh, overthrow of monarchy, the way in which the United States settled the whole continent over time. So you hear these discussions about the frontier experience, the way that shaped the way Americans conceive themselves, and a sense of wider mission in the world. Right? The notion that the US is, for instance, the world's only superpower at the moment. Now, what's interesting about those claims is, is not that they're true, although some of them are in some way interesting, right? And some of them do reflect truths. The US was one of the first uh, real anti-colonial revolutions. Um, you know, the US did sort of engage on settlement, you know, whether we want to call it a good thing or not, is, of course depends on whether you're talking to the Native Americans or not. Um, and the US is sort of the strongest country in the world in many ways. Um, but of course, every country is an exception. Right? Every country is different. Every country has its own history that makes it interesting. Okay? So the notion that America alone sort of is separate from the rest of the world, I think, is quite problematic. Um, crucially, right, since World War II, the United States and Great Britain and a number of other countries have worked hard to build up what we might think of as an international set of institutions. Right? If, if foreign policy has largely been this world, in which uh, power has been exercised you know, over other countries. Since World War II, actually, these countries have made fair efforts to try and domesticate international politics, right? to create institutions that created international laws and enact those laws. So the United Nations, for instance, the World Trade Organization, uh, all of these kinds of organizations were created with the US and UK backing and we're going to attempt to create, if you will, a sort of quasi-international government in which norms and expectations were created. Um, the International Criminal Court is an interesting uh, example, right? So after World War II, for the first time, we had war crimes tried, right? So the uh, Nuremberg trials, for instance, in which Nazis were, were put on crimes for, uh, put on trial for crimes against humanity. And this idea has been maintained over time. So you see war crimes tribunals in uh, Rwanda and in Cambodia and in a number of places like that. What's interesting, though, is that even as the US has supported these ad hoc tribunals, war crimes tribunals, uh, when somebody said, why don't we just have an international criminal court in which war crimes could be? All war crimes would go. And the U.S. is like, oh wait a minute, <laughs> right? Because this is one that the U.S. might get put in the docks for. So, in all of these places, uh, the nuclear weapons is about a nuclear, you know, the attempt to create a nuclear weapon uh, or non-proliferation treaties, etc. International Criminal Court, <coughs> uh, the United Nations in general. The U.S. has tried to exempt itself from the world order that it is hoping to create for others. Okay? And often resorting to claims of exceptionalism. So let's talk a little bit more about storytelling and the, the stories that get told, uh, not only in international affairs, but in superheroes. Right, I want to focus for a moment on two classic narratives. Okay, on the left, we have what's called the classical monument. This is uh, a famous, if you will, story that Joseph Campbell, this uh, anthropologist, in the mid 20th century, claimed was found in every society on the planet. He called it, you know, the universal story. Actually, the book was called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was a nice name. So the idea is that in every society you have this hero. Um, but so the story is about a hero who leaves the community, who goes off, faces trial, faces tribulation, comes home transformed by that experience, and participates in the community. Okay, now, it's not technically true that you can find this in every society, but we might forgive Campbell for, for that mistake. Uh, but we can maybe understand why this story exists, right? It's basically the story of adolescence, right? It's a coming-of-age story. 
you are a child, you go through this horrible period. <laughs> As I say, it gets better, trust me. Uh, you go through adolescence, and then you come out as an adult, and you have, if you will, the, the power that comes with being an adult to participate in the community as a full-fledged member. Okay? So we, we might understand, actually, why the story appears in so many different societies. If there's one thing that sort of everybody has to go through, it's adolescence, and it sucks. Um, on the right, we see a variation on the story. Okay? The American, the American monument, uh, which I'm pulling from this, uh, this author, Stuart Lawrence, in which you have an itinerant hero. The, the story starts, if you will, with a hero who has no home. The hero comes to a place, sees trouble, saves that community, but then never stays, right? Never integrates with the community, and instead moves on. And this, this originates in the 1930s. Stuart and Lawrence mentioned, in particular, uh, the, the kind of classic version is the Western, right? So the Western, you have a town that's got some guys who come in, you know, wearing the black hats, and they're not happy, and they're raising hell, and, you know, the town doesn't know what to do, and then in comes the guy in the white hat, and he chases them all out of town, you know, but does he stay and marry a farmer's daughter? No, you know, he's just got to keep going, and he rides off into the sunset, right? It's the kind of the most famous ending of any kind of movie, because it happens all the time, right? Now, <clears throat> this is not just the Western, though, right? This is basically the, the mythology that we live with today. So on the left, we have the classical monuments again. We have Star, the original Star Wars. Don't, don't ask me about the prequels. I mean, like, do not deign to speak of the prequels. But the original trilogy, right? This is, you know, uh, what's his name? Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker. You know, he is the, the child, right? He goes off to Yoda's planet, Jacob, who's counting them, and uh, is transformed, he gains his new powers, but what does he do? Does he sort of set himself up as a heroic figure? He actually just goes back and joins the rest of the rebellion, right? He's here just flying ships like a regular guy. He's just another pilot, even though he has to be able to move stuff with his brain. Um, so a perfect example of someone who goes off, gains these new skills and powers, and comes back to help the community. On the right, we have uh, the original Spider-Man film, uh, which I, I chose only because of this incredible kiss scene. <laughs> I've been trying to get my wife to reproduce the scene with me. Or, uh, she refuses to wear the mask. Okay. So, but on the, the, the Spider-Man, though, even though he's not itinerant, right? He lives in New York. Right? He is a New Yorker, they, they make that very clear. But he's itinerant in that nobody can know who he is, right? He can never sort of just be like, yeah, I'm Spider-Man, I went to work, I saved some people, I come home, I watch some TV, right? The whole story is about his inability to have a home life, right? He can never fully take the mask off. And if he ever does, then that person ends up getting killed, right? That's sort of the way they work out that bit of the narrative, right? So even though he's not itinerant, he can't have a home life, right? Not a proper one. Not the kind of home life that he secures for others. You see the difference? But consequently, because he's not ever integrated into a community, he's always basically breaking the law, right? The police are after him, the press are after him. And this is true, not just despite them, but most superheroes, right? They're always, you know, uh, they have this kind of difficult relationship with the law. Even when they're working with the law, the law can never know who they are. And it's usually some rogue, like, you know, in Batman, it's, what's his name, uh, Commissioner Gordon, who's the one guy in the know, and all the other police are sort of out of it, but Commissioner Gordon helps them here and there, you know? So, there's at least a troubled relationship with the law. So, uh, so I, what I'm trying to highlight here is that you know, the addition of the American monument to the classical monument is this notion of vigilantism. So, let's now cut back from superheroes to the real world. On the left, we have a quote from uh, an American diplomat when there were these debates about the International Criminal Court, which I introduced to you guys earlier. He says, what we've learned from the war on terror is that rather than creating an international mechanism to deal with these issues, i.e. law, uh, it is better to organize an international mandate that authorizes states to use their unilateral tools to tackle the problems we have. Let's take away the diplomat speak. What he's saying is, rather than having some big international thing that legitimates action, better just to let those who can do. <laughs> right? He's like, what we ought to do is just 
tell the US to go out and do it. Because when the US says we need unilateral action, it's never somebody else's unilateral action. It's always the unilateral action of the United States. So now I've laid that next to a longer quote from a comic book, uh, which if you haven't read, will soon be in movies, actually. They're doing the, the third Captain America film is based on the storyline. Civil War was this storyline in the mid-2000s, largely understood as a commentary uh, by Marvel Comics on the current state of politics, in which basically the events are slightly awkward, where some superheroes are fighting some supervillains, and something goes wrong, and a whole school is wiped out. Oops. <laughs> in reality, you would think this is the kind of, if there really were superheroes, this stuff would be happening all the time, right? I mean, there'd be mass casualties whenever superheroes got into fights with supervillains. But, obviously, in comic books, they don't tell the story that way. But so this one time, when something goes wrong, and the government says, we should, the US government says, we ought to do something about these superheroes, right? We should register them. We should make them work for the government, just like an FBI agent or something like that, right? We'll legitimate them. Uh, and that way we can sort of, if you will, regulate the industry. <laughs> and Captain America leads the group of superheroes who fight against that. Okay? He takes a whole bunch and they go away. Um, well, Iron Man, you may be familiar with Iron Man, he leads the group who's sort of like, <laughs> and what is, I think, actually quite reasonable. Yes, it is nuts that just a random guy can have a huge suit of armor and blow away buildings and buildings and stuff. You know, you would think, yeah, this probably should be regulated. Just like you or I can't own a tank. Okay, okay, it's just not allowed. But, that's me. So, here's Captain America having a discussion with his girlfriend. Sherry Carter. <laughs> Uh, because of Sharon's in, they're in the middle of the argument, she says, in response to why they should register, because they're risking other people's lives every time they jump into a firefight, and because it's against the law, and the rule of law is what this country is founded on, Captain America says, no, it's founded on breaking the law because the law was wrong, meaning the American Revolution. She says, that's semantics, Steve, you know what I mean. He says, it's not semantics, Sharon, it's the heart of the issue. The Registration Act is another step towards government control. So, even though it's framed through domestic politics, it's really the same dynamic as the role of the United States in the world, right? The idea is that we should, if you will, accept some people from the order and enable them to do the ugly stuff that has to happen so that the rest of us can live according to the law. Serve as permanent American exceptions to legal orders, right? Purportedly working outside the law to maintain the law, which is, of course, Nuts if you think about it, and yet it seems to work in these stories. Um, Captain America certainly fits this mold. But if you actually look at the stories, right, you get uh, to this tension, if you will, between liberal inter uh, internationalism, this notion that every country is the same, every country is equal, every country deserves the same rights, and, and it should be treated the same way, and a more universalist vision of Captain America as someone who acts in the world. Okay, who's able to intervene in foreign countries. So, we'll start off with this notion of American universalism, the notion of the whole world wanting to be like America and desiring American intervention. Uh, this is a quote from a, a World War II comic, so I apologize for the slightly racist language in it, but it's authentic to the times. Uh, so, Captain America is in South Asia. It's not entirely clear, but of course they refer to India at the time, but India was British India. Um, he says, uh, this man who's been, who's been rescued, I have been to state school. I have read of you and your deeds. America is the hope of the world. Go free, brave Sahib, and crush the evil faker who sells us to the little brown guys. The Japanese, yeah, I'm sorry. Don't weird me to say that stuff. Uh, but the best is that Captain America says, you bet I will. Get up on your feet. In America, we, deal, we kneel to no man. Now, crucially, they're not in America. Right? <laughs> so he's in South Asia, sort of imposing his view of, of uh, uh, behavior, if you will, even as he's clearly doing it uh, with this person's approval. Um, just in case that wasn't subtle enough, here is uh, some dialogue between Captain America and Satan. Yes. <laughs> Actually, Captain America fights Satan three times. I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, and Satan has yet to win. So Satan says, you have won, mortal, but I shall come again when the time is right, when there is no longer a Captain America to champion the good. I will come, if need be, again and again. And Captain America says, there will always be an American 
to fight for mankind against the forces of evil, right? So there's clearly this conflation of the United States, not only with being a sort of good force in the world, but on a kind of cosmic religious scale, right? In the, in the world of uh, good and evil, at the grandest scale, it's an American who must uh, lead the forces of good. Now, you know, we should lend some nuance to this, okay? Because what's interesting to me is less that sort of massive universalism, but actually, what happens when you start thinking about actual places in the world where the United States has had an intervention? So, here we get to that notion of liberal interventionism, or interventionism. What does it mean to treat countries the same or to respect boundaries? So, when you look at this, actually most of the places where Captain America goes overseas are either places where, that are willingly accepting him and asking for his help, or uh, are sort of just not politically sensitive. But, of course, during the first, say, 10 years or so of Captain America's comic in the 60s, right, there was an actual imperial war going on, right? The United States was intervening in Vietnam. Uh, and it's amazing, because of course he is if you've seen the movies or read in the comic books, Captain America is this hero from World War II. He's a super soldier. He was created by the government to fight its wars. And during World War II, basically, in every comic, he's out punching Nazis with the Japanese. Uh, but during the Vietnam War, a whole 10 years or so, he only goes to Vietnam twice. And both reasons are explicitly not to go fight on behalf of American foreign policy. Once he goes to rescue a downed American pilot who was the little brother of someone who had saved Captain America's life in World War II. So it's almost like he's doing a personal thing. He's trying to rescue his friend. Uh, and then later, he goes and rescues Dr. Hoskins, who has been, who is a doctor. So it's almost like Doctors Without Borders today. He just sort of sets up camp in Vietnam and treats whoever comes in. And a supervillain, uh, the Mandarin, kidnaps Dr. Hoskins with, <laughs> with the notion that this, each side will blame the other for kidnapping this nice man and he'll only amplify the war. Uh, by being kidnapped, which, you know, if you're already at war, I'm not sure a missing doctor would make that much of a difference. But, um, in any event, Captain America goes to, to save that guy, right? So, he's doing, if you will, the, like, the, the least objectionable thing he can in Vietnam. And then, crucially, the 2003 Iraq War, which is probably the other great moment in which American foreign policy is being viewed as imperialist, right? he, he doesn't go there at all until it's almost over. And then he goes again, not to fight, but almost as a diplomat. So he goes and he's visiting various elders, and here you see him having some tea. Right? It's very, I know it's charming. Um, it's good to know all the muscles, you can still sort of stretch well enough to sit on the floor. He's not bad, I mean, he is like 70 years old in this image too, so you know, we should all hope to be so flexible at that point in life. Um, so, you know, they're, they're basically avoiding any kind of pretense of conflict. Uh, another kind of key example here is this notion of sovereignty, right? Sovereignty is the, the principle that every country has uh, the right to govern its own affairs internally. And it's, it's, if you will, the defining characteristic of being a country. So, I'll have to give some context for this example here. Captain America is uh, just going through the streets of New York and he's kidnapped by someone who has mistaken him for someone else. Now, all the big mistakes you can make, you know, kidnapping Captain America by accident uh, is probably one of the big ones. But so he wakes up, basically, in this unnamed Central American country. And sort of bizarrely, despite, you know, what you would think of as being quite aggrieved, he, when he realizes that he's in Central America, uh, and he's been kidnapped by this man called the Swine, who's the dictator of the country, he, he's not mad, he doesn't decide to go find the swine and punch him out or something. Um, he's like, what's going on in this country isn't any of my business. <laughs> he's like, I'm just going to go home. And so when he does that, though, he's, he goes to leave, but then he sees, you know, a series of people being beaten up by the swines, stooges, etc. He also finds his sort of heart call to help these people. So despite his initial reluctance, he manages to, just, you know, to overthrow the government. But the quote is great. Whoever runs that banana jail seems to get his kicks out of kicking the inmates. This man they call the swine must be typical of the kind of bully that flourishes in these two-bit dictatorships. But this is not my country and not my place to fight for causes I know nothing about. Now, crucial here is, of course, that in real life, the US put every one of those dictatorships into office. 
and maintained them with a steady supply of weapons, and they would uh, crack down on anybody who was opposing those governments. So, you know, the notion of Captain America sort of being like, oh, I have nothing to do with these people. In truth, he has everything to do with them. Uh, but in terms of the narrative, that's not what they want to tell us. And then the best part is when he decides to get involved, he, he punches out some guy and he says, he'll never bring new business to that area with this attitude. And again, the whole point of those Central American dictatorships is that they would continue to sell bananas and stuff to the United States and <laughs> cut rate prices. So the idea that you know, there isn't enough business is not the problem, it's, it's who's doing the business. So, to conclude, uh, what I'm trying to show in this uh, quick lecture is that being a superpower is really more than about simple military might, or simple political clout. And those things are easy. But if you have a whole world that you are subjugating via military might or uh, by economic you know, suppression, guess what? At some point, they're going to rise up against you. Okay? You, you can't fight everyone everywhere. So it's, it's a terrible strategy. But if you can convince people that you are legitimate and righteous in your use of power, and that it's actually in their interest for you to be around and breaking those international laws, for instance, and doing things that other people don't want to do or can't do, uh, then they might be willing to let you kind of stick around in some preferential trade deals and otherwise ignore a lot of the uh, stuff that you pull. So being a cultural superpower is quite important. Now, if you can convince people through the narratives you tell that you are righteous and acting in everyone's good, then you won't have to fight everyone in order to maintain your power. Right? Rather, you know, they will they will actually thrust it upon you. So uh, these kinds of superhero narratives and other stories as well. I mean, we can easily look at. Don't get started on the Transformers films. <laughs> They're unbelievable. Um, but these kinds of narratives reproduce the kind of world, they narrate the world in ways that serve American hegemony, right? that promote the role of the United States in the world. So when we talked about, at the beginning, the East and West and the characteristics of good and evil that get imputed to whole swaths of the Earth, uh, we need to think about these kinds of stories too and the ways in which they are reproducing a certain kind of geopolitics. In the specific case of Captain America and the USA, and I've run them together because I think the narratives are the same, the superhero narrative is basically a, a scaled down version of the narrative told at the global level. There's a, always a disavowal of imperialism, right? The US isn't here to take something or to do something for itself. But instead, there's always an excuse that is there for this particular intervention, right? The US never claims to want to intervene anywhere, but is always sort of reluctantly dragged in, right? Like the like Spider-Man getting ready to sit down and have dinner with his girlfriend, and you know, what's that? Sirens? Oh geez, okay. You know, I won't eat this time. So hopefully this has broadened the notion of superpower in your mind, and I'm sure that you have 10,000 versions of these stories that you can think of uh, in other genres as well. I look forward to a discussion.